Good morning. <laughs> if we think that being in Christ means that we will have health, wealth, and an end to all the problems in this life, we are sadly mistaken. In fact, Jesus said in John 16, in this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In Christ, we have peace with God, which secures our hope and future beyond the troubles of this world. We place our faith in Jesus because he died on the cross for us, answers us when we call, and always keeps his promises, bringing him glory. This is how he never lets us down. This is how he won't ever fail. Let's stand together as we sing Firm Foundation for the last time this month. Let's sing it out this morning. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not Cause I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would he fail now? He won't He won't seated this morning. Well, good morning, church family. Jesus Christ is risen. risen That wasn't quite in unison. Let's try that again. Jesus Christ is risen. risen 
That's better. That's better. A little bit of union there together, unity. So, uh, welcome to Southside Baptist Church. We're so very glad that you're here today. Uh, if you are visiting with us for the very first time, and we want to make you feel welcome as well. I don't want to embarrass you or expect anything of you. We just I uh, just pray that you will uh, feel warmed and blessed as we gather together in worshiping our Lord. I would ask you to do this if it's not too embarrassing. If uh, you are visiting with us for the very first time, would you just mind just letting us know by just raising your hand just a little bit? We want to get you uh, right up here. This is some of Caleb's family uh, visiting with us today. We just have a little token of our appreciation for y'all being with us today. Hope you can enjoy that. So, um, let me make just a couple of announcements. I'll try to be very brief. One is, uh, tomorrow night is the men's rally at Rice Memorial Baptist Church. That's at 7 o'clock, so hope to see uh, a lot of you guys there, if you can possibly make that. Um, oh, the other thing I want to make sure I did is part of... Um, being baptized in a local church is being received as a member. So uh, Caleb Hansen this morning is coming to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, but uh, based on a profession of faith and him following the Lord in believer's baptism, uh, I move that we receive him as a full member here at Southside Baptist Church. Do I have a second? Got a second. All those in favor, would you let it be known by saying amen? amen. All right. Any, any opposed? Uh, just, I don't know, stand up and leave or something. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, well, Caleb, we're very, very thankful, and we'll have more to say about your uh, following the Lord's in baptism as the day goes on. Okay. I believe the last announcement I have is just to say thank you for all of you that have brought uh, baked goods. And, man, I got to tell you, I walked by and I saw, it's like one of my weaknesses, right? Little Debbie cakes. Y'all might be so healthy you don't eat Little Debbie cakes, but them things are bad to the bone. I'm telling you, Little Debbie cakes, uh, they are just, <laughs> they're just good. And you've seen the kind now, they're like birthday cake, Little Debbie cakes. My daughter was telling me over in Georgia they got something going on. What did, Kim, what did she say they're making at a Little Debbie birthday cakes? Little Debbie birthday cake cheesecake. That would set you back uh, a few months, I'm sure. Uh, okay, but in, seriously, thank you for bringing that. We will, we will be uh, delivering those this week, and the baked goods that you've brought today, uh, we'll be delivering that this week to our local schools, and I'm told we have enough to take to all four of the local uh, fire departments and so forth. So thank you for your response to that. And before we go on with the, today's worship service, I want to just pray for our school teachers and pray that just giving them this little gift will, will signify to them that there is a community that does support them, that does love them, and does pray for them and our children. So can we do that together now as a church? Our Lord and our God, we, we come before you this day, Lord, uh, thanking you for uh, a new school year, thanking you for the men and women who have uh, dedicated their lives to uh, educating our children. God, we know that they do not take the place of parents. Uh, God, we, we pray that we as parents and grandparents would do due diligence uh, to love and to shepherd and to teach and train our children. That, that's from you, God. Uh, but, Lord, we as a culture have school teachers, we have schools. And so, Father, we, we pray for this coming year, uh, not just here in Abbeville County, but, Lord, uh, across the nation. God, we pray that there might be, um, Father, a, um, Lord, a turn in many ways from the ways that our schools have been going, have been trending. Lord, we pray that there would be a new trajectory where, where students are, are um, encouraged to speak openly about you, to, to know you, to love you. And, uh, and, and so, God, we pray for our school system. We pray for those uh, who are in leadership, who are on the um, on school boards and things such as that. God, that you would give those men and women great wisdom and courage to do the right things. And then, Father, we pray this year for, for our students, um, 
as they gather in classes week in and week out, Father, we pray for their protection. We pray that um, you would just bless our teachers, that you would ground them in truth, and they not be afraid to teach that which is absolute truth. And God, we pray that even as um, we here in this, this little local church, Lord, send these small gifts to these teachers, that they would be reminded that they are loved and that they are prayed for, not just this week, but throughout this school year. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to do something small, something kind in a way that displays your love to a needy community. We pray all of this in the blessed name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen and amen. Hebrews 13 says that Jesus suffered to make people holy through his own blood. We die to self and we become more and more like Christ as the Holy Spirit works in us. Let's sing this morning the wonderful cross. The wonderful cross. When I survey Truly live Oh God 
strong you and bless your name love so amazing so seated this morning. This morning we will continue in our study through the book of Romans. Today we are in Romans chapter 7 and we're going to uh, cover a lot of verses but um, it doesn't take as long as you might think uh, to cover these verses. Um, Before we do that, I want us just to go to the Lord in prayer that, in such that this would not just be an academic exercise, that we not just be sitting here going through the motions because this is what we do on Sunday, but that we would uh, lean into God's Word, that we would, uh, if we are a, a skeptic, if we have skeptical tendencies, that we would be willing to listen to uh, Paul's arguments here in Romans. Uh, if we are discouraged today, that we might be encouraged. Uh, that w if we are on the verge of depression, that we would understand that there is great reason not to be depressed. We're going to pray now that God would just open our eyes and bless this time. I'm going to call on someone to pray this morning. James, would you mind just right where you are, just stand there and just uh, pray for this time of our worship service. Thank you.
Amen. And one reason I had him pray is to prove to you guys down here that there are people who sit up there in the balcony. You just don't see them every, uh, every Sunday. So the warship, the CSS Shenandoah, was purchased from the British in October of 1864. That's just a little bit before Lee would uh, surrender at Appomattox, right? It was commanded by Captain James Waddell. The CSS Shenandoah sailed the high seas on a mission to capture and destroy Union commercial vessels. So it achieved its greatest success, believe it or not, in the months that followed Lee's surrender at Appomattox as it decimated the Yankee whaling fleet that was operating in the Bering Sea off the Alaskan coast. I had no earthly idea that there was Civil War stuff going on in the Bering Sea. It just blows my mind. Well, in November of 1865, seven months after Lee surrendered at Appomattox, the Shenandoah fired the last shots of the Civil War and lowered the Confederate flag for the very last time. The war was over, effectively at least, in April, but the battle raged on. For Christ's followers, the war with sin is over. You look skeptical when I said that. Christian, your war with sin is over. But you know as well as I do that the battle rages on, doesn't it? Well, I'm going to tell you up front that today's message is based on a text that was written by a Christian, written for Christians. And when we properly understand this text, I believe there is as much encouragement in this text as any other text in all of God's Word. Last week, we saw that through our union with Christ, we are set free from the Mosaic Law. Remember, we talked about there being three components to the Mosaic Law. There is the uh, ceremonial law that was a shadow of that which was to come. So that when Christ came and died on the cross and was raised again, that the ceremonial law was abrogated. We no longer have need for that ceremonial law. That's why we don't gather on Sunday mornings and sacrifice bulls and goats and such. The civil law was given by God to Israel so that they would live according to His desires as a theocracy in the promised land. The civil law, therefore, for the most part, doesn't apply today. But finally we learn that in Christ, in Christ, through our union with Christ, we died to the moral law. We are no longer in bondage to the law to earn righteousness from God. That is good news. The law is no longer pressing on us from the outside in. We are changed, those of us who have been converted, At conversion, we're changed so that the law is now written on our hearts so that we love and desire and we want to keep the law from the inside out. If you allow yourself just a little while to imagine a very religious contemporary of Paul, hearing what Paul has been arguing for these first six chapters, If you hear him, imagine that he's heard Paul talking about our need for a righteousness that that comes from outside of ourselves, that that we're not able to reach down and pull our spiritual selves up by the bootstrap, so to speak, and we have nothing that we can bring to the table when it comes to our salvation, that we're totally dependent on a righteousness that God owns and that He credits to our account by faith. 
And you are this religious person who's heard Paul talk about this and you hear Paul talking about that we're no longer bound to the moral law. What does that mean? We're no longer bound to this law, but we're freed to marry another. Imagine this lawyer has finally heard enough. He's reached his boiling point and now he pushes back against what Paul has been arguing. His objection goes something like this. Paul. Have you lost your mind? The law, Paul, came from God. But you're talking about the law like it came from the devil. Is the law sin? Is that what you're saying? So that's what Paul deals with in chapter 7. He's arguing this, and is the law, he's going to answer this question, is the law sin, and is the law ultimately what we're fighting against? So those are the two questions that we'll look at today. The first question, is the law sin? I'm going to read verses 7 through 12 of Romans 7. It says this, Paul asked the question, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. If you remember me a few weeks ago telling you that a member of Martin Lord Jones's church approached him, and he had been preaching there for years. Dr. Lord Jones, when are you going to preach through Romans? He said, as soon as I can understand Romans 6. He finally did, and he preached almost 300 sermons through the book of Romans. I'm wondering why he didn't say, as soon as I can understand Romans 7. Uh, At first blushed, we're left reading this going, what is this all about? I don't quite comprehend this. I think, though, once we grasp this, we're going to go, oh, yeah. And not only will we go, oh, yeah, I think we're going to go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In verses 7 through 12, Paul's describing a before and an after time frame. Just a cursory view. Look, Just for instance, look in verse 9. Verse 9 says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. This is my belief and others would hold differently, but I believe Paul is talking about his time as a Pharisee in these verses, verses 7 through 12. He describes his experience as a Pharisee, and as you remember, Pharisees were part of the super religious party in Israel at the time. Right, um, They would be the people in, nowadays who would be very, very strict to the law. They would never go other than 55 miles an hour. 56 would be illegal. 56 would be breaking the law. So they would never go 56. They would never spit on the sidewalk. They would never jaywalk and cross the road downtown Abbeville at a place other than an intersection. They would never take a grape from the grocery store. You've never done that, I'm sure. They would certainly never do that. They would never tear the tags off of their pillows, which is illegal. Have you ever just wanted to buy a pillow and just pull the tags off just to get them back? Because the government made that rule, so I'm just going to go around and pull all the tags off the pillows just because I don't know why that rule is there, but it's there. That's, That's what they were like. Paul would describe himself this way in another place. He would say, circumcised the eighth day, just like a good Jew should be, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Listen, 
touching the righteousness which is in the law. Do you know the word Paul uses? Blameless. That's how he would describe himself as a Pharisee. Touching the law as a Pharisee, Paul says, I was blameless. But there was the time Paul had, he was zealous for the law. He believed he was actually living the law. He didn't murder. He didn't commit adultery. He didn't worship other gods than Yahweh. Surely he tithed everything. He would probably, if he could, count out all the little pieces of salt and give one of the ten away. He would have tithed cumin. If he would have made $2,356 a month, he would have tithed $235.60. He was a strict legalist. But he describes this time in his life as, listen, as being without the law. He was alive without the law. He was living a holy life. But listen, but then he says, the law came in and it killed Paul. What's he talking about? What on earth is he talking about here? I believe this is what he's talking about. We have to go back to the words of someone even more famous than Paul, and that would be Jesus. And Jesus, on his Sermon on the Mount, he is discussing the law. And in the law, Jesus is he's expounding on the law. He is giving his interpretation of the law. He gets to the heart of the law, not just to the surface. Jesus begins, and you know what is... In that sermon, he says, you have heard it said, but... What does he say? What does he say? You've heard it said, but I say to you. That's the, that's the, 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 the way the whole thing goes, the paradigm. You've heard it said, but I say to you. In other words, Jesus said, you've had all these other teachers, and this is what they're teaching about the law. But listen, I am the ultimate interpreter, and here's what the law means. He's getting to the heart of the matter. So he would have said it, maybe not, didn't say it exactly like this, but this is what he was getting at. He would have said, sure, you've not cheated on your wife, but when you look at porn, you are committing adultery. Sure, you've never killed anyone, but your seething anger is murder. And then he would say, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, it's what comes out. Why would he say that? Why would Jesus say it's not what goes in that defiles a person, it's what comes out? Because the mouth is tied to the heart. And whatever is coming out of your mouth, Jesus is saying, is really exposing what is deep down inside of you. It is your heart. It is who you are. It's what in the heart that matters, what's in the heart that matters, not simply the externals. You understand what he's getting at here. So Paul is starting to say, hold on, when when I'm starting to comprehend, the law is not just little strict little strictures, but he's really getting at the heart. I didn't do well in organic chemistry in college. I did awful, actually. I really did really bad. I didn't flunk, but I came as close as you possibly could to flunking organic chemistry. But I loved the lab. I love organic chemistry lab. And one of the cool things that we would do is they would give us this this pure, pristine, clear liquid. And they would say, we want you to, to, to determine what this liquid is. And the way you would determine that would be take another pure, pristine, clear liquid and drop some drops of that clear liquid into the other clear liquid. You understand what I'm getting at? And if that... Clear liquid turned ink black, then you knew it was potassium chlorate or whatever, right? Um, that's the way it worked. That, that, that little drop, those few little drops you dropped in there served as a catalyst. Paul is saying that the law in its truest sense served as a catalyst. He was getting along just fine, hunky-dunky-dory good in life. But then along comes the genuine message of the law, the heart of the law. He was keeping the law, he thought. 
until one day the import of the law made sense to him. And it's like God took the, the true law and dropped it into Paul's life. And where he was alive, he thought he was alive. All of a sudden, the law is a catalyst and it shows him how sick he really was. It shows him how far from God he really was. The law was introduced. Sin came alive. Paul was a dead man walking. And then he would say, and the more that the law was understood, the more that sin came alive and the more I died. When we lived in Hawaii, yes, somebody has to live there. He didn't live there, be unpopulated, so somebody had to live there. And when we lived in Hawaii, when we first moved there, we lived in this, the whole time, we lived in this duplex, this concrete block, like, like these concrete block uh, duplex with hard tile floors. One day in one of the bedrooms, uh, they had these little metal uh, doors that slid to get into the closet, and they had metal runners on the bottom, and they were about two inches wide. And there was, uh, and I noticed this this bug with uh, wings on it was messing around that hole. I said, man, I, that's probably not good. You don't want bugs with wings on it around. You know, so I went and grabbed some raid or whatever and sprayed that on there and killed that bug. And I'm, I'm thinking, man, I did good. But I got to look and I was like, man, there's a hole there. And, you know, that bug had come out of that hole. I said, maybe there's some more bugs down in there. So I, I said, what I got right here is not going to do any good. This, this can of raid. I said, I got to get this jug of whatever that jug was and I pour a little bit of that down in there, and all of a sudden, like four or five of these bugs came crawling out. Like, man, that's not good. I thought, man, I probably ought to empty my jug. And that's what I did. I poured the whole, almost the whole jug down in that hole and just kind of forgot about it. Left the next day. The next day, I opened the door to that bedroom. Y'all, there were there were there was a pile of these bugs with wings on it that thick across the entire floor. If I had to number it, I would just number in the hundreds of thousands. I don't even know what, I don't know if they were like, I don't know if termites got wings, I don't know. But it was like, this is not good. The more you poured that stuff in there, the more it, it exposed them. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's like, the more I understand the law, the truer the law is, the, the way it becomes clear to me is, man, my sins grow. They, they're exposed. The light is shined on them. So, y'all, the answer to the question in verse 7, what then shall we say that the law is sin? The answer is no. The law is not sin. Sin took advantage of the law in Paul's life. And it came to life and it rendered Paul dead. Now, we might think that we're not all that bad. We're sitting here in a nice little air-conditioned room and, and our lives are pretty good. Uh, sure, we're not perfect, but we're not as bad as others around us in our culture. We're not thieves or addicts or adulterers or homosexuals or you just fill in the blank. We have this idea that somehow God's just this, this good old guy who's sitting up there in heaven. He's got a great plan, but God is so good that when it's all said and done, God's just going to weigh out the good and weigh out the bad. And all those filthy, evil, sorry scumbags of the world, they're going to get what they deserve. The rest of us who've really tried hard and we've lived our lives the best we can, not perfect, right? I mean, nobody's perfect, right? But, but God's going to have a good sense of right and wrong, and he's just going to kind of wink, say, come on in, you, were, you did your best. Y'all, that is not who God is. Our very best falls way, way short. You see, the impact of the spiritual law, when we begin to understand what God is saying, the impact of that not-so-badness compared to others, it no longer holds water. We stop measuring ourselves against other people, and we start measuring ourselves against the plumb line of, of God. And so we then begin to understand that the good that we thought we were, it's exposed. We learn that even the good stuff we do is so tainted with selfishness and impure motivations. That's what the law does to us. The law is not evil, the law is not sin. But the law gives sin a, an environment in which to grow, so to speak. Now, we're moving on to the 
the second question. And this is real important. Something happens in Paul's life between verses 12 and 13. It doesn't show up here, but it's implied here. You say, where do you get that? Well, just a cursory view, and and we could go into a long talk about this. We're not going to do that, but uh, Paul is converted between verses 12 and 13. He's referring to a time in his life in verses 7 through 12, his pre-conversion life, but he was very much religious, okay? That's what's going on there. But look at what he's, beginning in verse 13, it's all present tense. Just, Just follow me. Uh, it would down in verse, okay, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Look at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. What does he say? But I am. He doesn't say I was. He says I am of the flesh sold under sin. Verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions for I do not do what I want. But I do the very things that I hate. Now, if I do, and so on and so forth. So throughout this whole passage, he's talking in the present tense. And so here we get to this next question then in verse 13. Is the law ultimately what we are fighting against? Verse 13, did that which is good then bring death to me? Does the law bring death? Is that what we're fighting against? And Paul would say, by no means. In other words, what he's asking, are God's standards of righteousness... Are God's rights and wrongs, is that what troubles us so? There's a controversy here that godly people disagree on in verses 13 through 25. Some believe that Paul is describing his pre-conversion life, what it was like as a non-believer. For reasons I won't go into, I don't believe that what, that's what Paul is talking about. believe that Paul is describing his life right now. He's talking about his life as a Christian. It's all present tense. You really have to do some hermeneutical gymnastics to make verses 13 through 25 talk about something that is in the past. Paul is talking about his life where he is now saved. He's describing his continual, listen, his continual battle as a Christian with indwelling sin. So again, then in verse 13, is the law the enemy? Is the law what we are fighting against? Does the law send us to hell? The answer is certainly not. Look at verse 13 again, I'll read it. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Paul says, it's sin in me that's the problem. The law comes in, it's a catalyst, and sin is revealed, and at once I'm dying. That's his point. Then in verse 14, he goes on. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. What's he talking about there? When he talks about flesh here, he's not talking about his body per se. He's talking about his nature before he was a believer. He's talking about that old sinful nature. The smoldering fires of a battle that's been lost. And then we get to verse 15 through 23. And I want to read these now. And Paul is describing a divided man. This divided man, he's describing himself that way. He says there's this inner man, there's this new nature. It's the way that God sees Christians. And he says, and there's also the old nature that we're fighting against. So follow along in verse 15. He says, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Can y'all relate to any of this at all? Are you kind of like going, oh, okay, this is starting to... 
is kind of touching me where I am. Uh, For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Verse 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So, I find it to be a law. I think that's an unfortunate translation here. I think a better word would be principle, but we'll use law. So, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but... I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And so there's the old nature that that is lingering still and it's waging war even though the war is over, right? The war is over. The war was over when Christ went to the cross and he died on that cross for sinners who would believe in him. The peace accords were written in Christ's blood. The war is over for you as a believer. Your battle with sin is over. Yet we know, you know just like Paul knew, the battle continues. Paul is expressing what we know to be true. We know we want to be holy. We know we want to honor God. But part of us wants exactly the opposite. Isn't that right? Does that resonate with you? Part of me knows I need to honor God. I want to serve God. I want to love God. I, I mean, I want to do what God wants me to do. But at the very same, on the very same token, part of me is going, no, you know, I really don't. I don't want to do that. I like this way I feel when I do this. I like the power when I express myself this way. I like to covet a little bit because it's fun to think about what it would be like to have other people's stuff. It's the way we work. That old self-centered me, myself, and I is still, listen, it is still latent within us as believers. If you don't grasp that, your life as a believer will be one of hopelessness. It will be one of, man, I don't understand what it means to be a follower of Christ because I still fight sin. Paul is saying that even as, especially as a devoted follower of Christ, he, listen, this is the Apostle Paul. God defines him as, you know, maybe the the epitome of a Christ follower. He is the truest example of somebody who was religious, who was absolutely opposed to God. He was going after the church, y'all. He was hunting down Christians and killing them. That's who he was. But you know the story. God comes to him. God reveals himself to him. God says, Paul, I am Jesus who you're fighting against. And Paul has a conversion just like you and I who are in Christ had conversion. It wasn't as flashy as Paul's. But right, God changed us. He changed us not, not so much the way we feel, but the way he looks at us. When God converted you, it means that He no longer looks at you as a sinner on your way to a devil's hell, but He looks at you as a saint possessing eternal life, even though we don't feel that way many times. But if Paul, the greatest of the apostles, wages war daily with indwelling sin, why do you and I think it's some mysterious event that we are battling sin as well? But in verse 17, Paul says, But now it is no longer I who do it, 
but sin that dwells in me. Verse 20, he says the same thing. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. What is he talking about there? It is no longer I. It is no longer the new me. It is no longer the one who Christ lives within. It is not the redeemed me. It is the vestiges of the old man that, that, that lingers, that the smoke from that battle is still coming up. But, but that war is over. So it's no longer me. It's no longer who Christ sees. It's sin. It's this latent power that is still left over and it will be there until the day God takes me home. You ever cut the head off a snake? I mean, that's weird. You cut the head off a, I mean, a, a snake, some of those, you know, real... Like, rattlesnakes or big old snakes like that and big old poisonous snakes you cut that head off that thing keeps on wiggling that's weird man that is really weird and what's even weirder that snake can still bite you john owen one of the greatest theologians of the 17th century describes indwelling sin this way he, he says indwelling sin is a powerful inward law or principle lodged in the heart whose whole nature is enmity against God. This powerful river flowing from the fall can only be brought under control by regenerating grace. Listen to what he says. However, sin's enmity remains in believers after conversion and the long war against it is one in which all Christians must engage. <laughs> if anybody ever tells you that, just give your life to Jesus. Just raise your hand and just ask Jesus into your heart. Everything's going to be good. Praise the Lord and send me a big check when you do it. If anybody ever tells you that, that your life is going to get so much easier... That your problems are going to just vanish. When you become a Christian, run. Don't walk. Run as fast as you can away from that advice. That is not what it means to be a Christian. In many ways, y'all, you know this is true. In many ways, when you come to know Jesus, your problems only begin. They just start. You just start to have a whole other different kind of problem. A good kind of problem. When well, verse 21, Paul says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies at hand. Huh. He's this raging battle between the inner man and the one that is now alive. Verses 22 and 23. I know I'm going fast, but we need to. Verses 22 and 23. Let's just read those four. Paul says, I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. Just, just read that as shorthand. The, the real me, the genuine me, the, the, who, who I am in Christ, Christ in me, I in Christ, I delight in God in my inner being. Verse 23, but, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Can you not say along with Paul, oh, wretched man that I am? Man, I set out and I want to do so good for God. I want to pray this week. I want to love Him. I want to visit. I want to call people. I want to honor Him. I want to listen to the right kind of music. I want to watch what's only pure and holy. And then five minutes after praying something like that, and the next thing you know, you're down in the mud. And you're going, man, wretched man that I am. Well, take heart, church. Not that that's a good thing, but the Apostle Paul wrestled with that too. Oh, wretched man that I am, but he says this, but thank God for the already and the not yet that is ours in Christ. Listen, already, if you are in Christ, already you have been saved from sin's penalty. What is sin's penalty? Eternal separation in a dark, dark place away from God. If you're in Christ, you have already been saved from that. I know we're not Baptocostals, but that should almost like make one person say, Amen! I'm saved from that. Very simple way of saying, when I die, I'm going to heaven. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what Christ has already done.
for me. That's an already. And here's a sort of already. I am being saved now from sin's power. But there's indwelling sin and I'm still fighting that war and I will continue fighting that war. But listen, there's also the instance or the, the understanding I will be saved one day from indwelling sin altogether. Saved already from sin's penalty. I'm being saved from sin's power right now. But praise God, one day we will be saved from indwelling sin altogether. That's a good thing. So as I close, let me just provide three real important afterthoughts. Number one, a wrong understanding of biblical conversion can lead to hopelessness. A wrong understanding of biblical conversion. When I say conversion, I'm talking about the two, two-sided coin of repentance from my sin. In other words, I turn away. I, I see sin. I don't want to do that anymore. I, that's not right. So I turn away. I turn. But then the other side of that coin is by faith I receive Christ. So it's repentance. It's, it's trust in Christ. But a wrong understanding of conversion can lead to hopelessness. What do I mean by that? A couple of things. Number one. You could come to this understanding by reading a text like this and you go, well, you know, I, I am saved uh, and so I'm going to always be dealing with sin. So what the heck, just, just kind of let's free for all. Just let go, let God, and he's going to do what he wants to do. Sin's not a big deal. It's all about grace. I'm just going to live by grace and not worry about anything. Y'all, that's not biblical. That's not biblical. A wrong interpretation of biblical salvation can lead to, ho- lead to hopelessness. But, but a second way, and this is what I think if you miss everything, don't miss this. Understand that being saved, when you are converted, you repent, and you trust. If you start to think that that means a life of absolute perfection, that can lead to despair. Read J.I. Packer's biography. Read about how he came to know Christ. And how close he came to taking his own life right after he learned that he was saved. He he fell immediately into a, a teaching of higher Christianity that, yeah, you've reached this level, but there is a level of perfection that you will reach on this side of heaven. You just got to fill in the blank. And it led him to despair. He was ready to take his own life because why? Because he was still sinning and he was going like this and Lord help us that we not think this way. But he was doing this. He was saying, I still have sin. It must mean I'm really not saved. You ever thought that? You ever think that? Don't let the devil win on you. Don't let the devil win on you. A second afterthought These verses describe a Christian who is at war with sin. Not one who is overwhelmed or, listen, or defined by his fleshly nature. He would say in verse 18, he says, There is nothing good in me. Then he qualifies that in the flesh. There is nothing good in me in the flesh. But whoa, there is something, absolutely someone, very, very good in In me, in the Spirit. And that is the Holy Spirit of the living God living within me. In other places, Paul could say this. This guy guy who just said, Whoa, oh wretched man that I am. In other places, Paul would say, Be an imitator of me, even as I'm an imitator of Christ. Y'all, we fight and we lose at times. And so when we fight and we lose at times, when we've lost and when we've been beaten down, we'll get back up and keep getting back up. You say, how many times do they have to keep getting back up? Every single time you fall and lose, get back up. That's not a sign that you're not a Christian. It's probably a a very good sign that you are. And third, Paul nowhere says that he is not responsible for his sin. The point he's making is this indwelling sin is like this latent power that's always making war with every step towards of holiness that he takes. Here's a little philosophy for you. You can think about this. And those of you who like to write me emails, write me an email and push back if you want to. 
But we always true choose what is our strongest inclination at that time. We always do. We never make a choice that doesn't reflect our strongest inclination at that time. You're going, hold on now. Hold on. Somebody comes up to me with a gun. And they say, I mean, you pick it. Give me your money or your life or give me your little child or your life. You're going to choose your strongest inclination at that time. What's your strongest inclination? Most people would say, you can have my money and I have my kid or whatever, right? But whatever your strongest inclination is at that time is what you're going to choose. Today, you might be decided, I'm going on a diet and I'm on a diet. And I'm on a diet a whole week. And that's my strongest inclination until it's my wife's birthday. And they come in with one of them birthday cakes like David made yesterday for that wedding. And you're sitting there going, hold on. My inclination for birthday cake right now is stronger than my inclination for the diet. Give me the birthday cake. It just works that way. And y'all, I'm not oversimplifying things here, but there, there is that latent, that, that, that power of the old sin nature that is always pushing and, and wanting us to be inclined in a way that's not honoring to God. So here's how I'm praying for me. This is how I pray for me. And if you choose to pray for you this way, amen. And if you'll allow me, I'll pray for you this way as well. But I've just been praying this a lot lately. God... Give me, please, what I need, not what I want. Give me what I need, not what I want. Why do I say that? Because, you know, deep down inside, my, man, I want some things that, that aren't really probably healthy. You know what I'm saying? So God, please, see beyond all the stuff I want and and where sin is so alive and powerful in my life. See beyond that, God. Give me what I need, not what I want. But listen, then there's more to the prayer. And then, oh God, cause me to want only what I need. I think if we can get there as believers, we are in a good place. Well, let's go to the Lord and pray. Our God and our Father, um, Lord, I thank you for the patience of this congregation today. I I pray, God, that uh, what's been spoken, uh, that you would sift through that, Lord, if I've said things that are wrong or not becoming or are not... um, are not edifying or, or inaccurate, I pray, God, that you would just root those out of our people's ears. They not remember those and not hear them. But God, I, I also ask, Lord, that that which is true, which is real, your word, I pray that it would find um, fertile soil. God, that you would do as what only you can do in our lives. God, I, I, Lord, it's, it's our prayer, Lord, that you would give us what we need not what we want. And then, God, you would change us such that we would want what it is that we really need. Lord, I don't pray that as some cute little saying. Because, God, I know how my wants and what I really need are so many times in conflict. So, God, I'm asking, despite what I might want... What, what that old fleshly nature might want. Please give me what I need. Please give us what we need. And Father, I, I pray this morning for those who are here that might not know you, Lord. I pray that if, if there's anyone or other people who are like that, that, God, they might come to know you, might see you in a different light. God, that they would Recognize that following Christ is not necessarily easy, but it is fulfilling. And it really is the only way. 
Father, we pray now as we conclude this worship service with song and a baptism, may it bring honor to your name. For We pray this in that precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Let's stand together this morning as we reflect and respond. We praise God for Christ, our sure and steady anchor. Let's sing. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn in the suffering in the sorrow when my sinking hopes are few I will hold fast to the Christ the sure and steady anchor while the tempest rages on when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won deeper still then goes the anchor though I justly stand accused I will hold Christ the sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief. Hopeless somehow, oh my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance, see his love forever proved. I will hold fast to the shall never be removed. Christ the sure and steady anchor as we face the wave of death. When these trials give way to glory and we draw our final breath, we will cross the the shore of our salvation ever faithful ever true we will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be removed thank you you may be seated Church, this is Caleb Hanson, and Caleb is coming to obviously follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Uh, you know, we might kind of take this lightly in one respect in our culture in which we live. Uh, you come, you get baptized, you have friends come and watch you and so forth. Other places in this world, it's not like that. In some places in this world, uh, to stand before people and put yourself out there as a Christ follower means Ostracized, being ostracized from your family, being ostracized from your culture and your community, and even some places, uh, death for following Jesus. So we take this very seriously. At the same time, we're extremely grateful to see young men who are not ashamed of following Christ. In this culture in which we live, where young people are encouraged to follow everything else but truth, uh, what a great blessing it is to see a young man who's bigger than me and taller than me already uh, follow the Lord. So, Caleb, um, I want you to just, can you share what it is? And let me just ask you this, first of all. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe that he is God the Son? Yes. Do you believe that he came and he lived on this earth and he, how are you shaking your head? And he, 
<laughs> do you believe that he lived on this earth and completely followed all of the law that we see in the Bible? Yes, sir. Do you believe that he went to a cross, was nailed to a cross, and was buried, and as important, he arose from the grave? Yes. Would you follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Let me ask you this. Why is it today that you are being baptized? Well, it's the next step. I was saved, and I want to be sanctified. Baptism is the next step to be sanctified. So, it's the next step. Amen. It's kind of a big word for 15, right? Yes, sir. Uh, 15, to say sanctified, but what does that mean? To be Christ-like. Okay. All right. And so you're following the Lord and believe your baptism, taking that first public step. So you're showing this congregation. But congregation, please understand this about baptism, okay? Yes, it is important. This is a day for Caleb. But in bat baptism, a worship service, this is really about all of us. The way God works this is, as, as He has followed the Lord in believers' baptism, you and I are reflecting back to what God has done in our lives, how God baptized us. He placed us into the body of Christ. So this is, this is about Him, but this is also about us. And the primary mover in this time is God Himself. Okay. All that I'll get you to turn this way. Well, based on your public profession of faith, it's my joy. It really is, brother. It is my great joy to baptize you today. Okay. I, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his glorious resurrection. Amen. Um, well, normally we would sing, but I forgot all about that. I'm dragging this along. Thank you for those uh, who are gathered today to uh, as visitors and to give testimony of what Caleb has done. If you are a person that doesn't know Christ and you just are, your interest is piqued by watching this, talk to somebody who's sitting around you and ask them what, what, what just happened, what does that mean? And perhaps you too want to be a follower of Christ. I'm telling you, you should not put your head on your pillow tonight if you don't know Jesus without surrendering your, your life Amen. to Christ. Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for this great day you've given us. We just love you and we praise you and we thank you for your word. May it do that which we can't do on our own. We love you and praise you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.